Okay, so before we begin, there is something important that I believe will need to be addressed. As many of you likely know, at the time of me recording this, Activision Blizzard is in the midst of going through multiple lawsuits regarding their work culture, one that has been horribly toxic and misogynistic, and that's just putting it simply. Now yes, the Blizzard side of the company has largely been the target of these claims on the lawsuit, but the Activision side has not done itself any favors. If anything, they've been making matters even worse. Because of this, I had initially chosen to stop the Crash 25th Anniversary Celebration following Top 15 Crash Bosses, which was uploaded around the same time that the first lawsuit was brought to light. This is why last month's video was on something unrelated to Crash. However, since then, I've thought it over more, and decided to go through with doing the last 25th Anniversary video after all. The way I see it, even though the series is currently owned by Activision, its legacy goes far beyond their ownership. And I do personally believe a milestone like this still deserves to be celebrated. That said, given the current ongoings, I did feel this still needed to be addressed. Crash may be more than just Activision, but we simply can't pretend this connection doesn't exist at all. Activision Blizzard's actions, both before and during the lawsuits, have been unacceptable, and I absolutely do not condone them. I know many have been pushing for an outright boycott of the company and their games, but I am also aware that many out there have very personal investments in some of their IPs, and dropping them entirely isn't necessarily as simple as flipping a switch. How you all personally choose to handle the situation is up to you, but for those who are on that boat, I would personally recommend finding ways to minimize support as best as you can, buying their games used, not purchasing microtransactions, stuff along those lines. But above all else, awareness of what's going on is most important. It's become apparent that some at Activision Blizzard are wanting to sweep this under the rug and continue on with how things currently are. So the more we can keep people aware of the situation and act accordingly, the better. Especially if we want a positive change in the gaming industry. I know this isn't the kind of note I usually start my videos on, but I did feel this was important to talk about. With that said though, on to the video itself. Hope you enjoy. September 9th, 1996. Not a particularly remarkable day in world history, as far as I'm aware. However, if you were into video games, particularly as a PlayStation fan, then said day did mark a pretty notable event. The beginning of the world's most renowned Bandicoot, a species that I bet many didn't even know existed until Crash was a thing. Developed as Sony's answer to Nintendo's Plumber Boy Mario, the original Crash Bandicoot was a huge hit after its launch, going on to be one of the PS1's top-selling games alongside its sequels. And while the PlayStation platformer mascot plan fell through, Crash did manage to keep that ball rolling, albeit with some stumbles here and there. And now here we are, 25 years after that fateful day. Well, not literally, I know I missed the mark in regards to getting this out by the day of his 25th anniversary, but the point is, as of this month, it's been 25 years since the Bandicoot's debut. Though funny enough, I'm actually recording this on September 9th, so... Happy 25th birthday, Crash! Now we have been celebrating this over the past few months in video form, but with this being Crash's birth month, especially for a milestone like 25, I wanted to do something extra special this time around. So instead of reviewing a specific Crash game or doing a countdown, I wanted to try something different and focus on... less official work. Given the 25 year legacy Crash has under his belt, it's no surprise that there's been fan creations based around this series. From fan art, to fan fiction, to even something as simple as making something Crash related in another game that allows it. Heck, I've done that myself! I actually made both Crash and Cortex in Soul Calibur 6's character creator a few years back. And it is as cursed as one could imagine. This kind of power was a mistake. That said, given the medium the Crash series made its start in, it only makes sense that a common type of fan creation for this franchise would be fan games. And this isn't a new thing for the series either. I've found stuff dating back to the mid-2000s, if not earlier. And today, to finish up the 25th anniversary celebration, I felt like taking a look at some of the Crash games that weren't made by the official developers. Though of course, this video is called Unofficial Crash Games and not Crash Fan Games. And that's because we're also going to be delving a bit both into bootleg territory and... Unsure of Label territory. Which brings us nicely into our first game, Crash Nitro Mini Golf. Now admittedly, this one is actually a bit of a stretch, as the original, as far as I'm aware at least, was actually an official Crash game. It was a browser-based shockwave game that was developed in 2003 by a company known as Skyworks Interactive, and was hosted on a site called CandyStand.com, which hosted several licensed browser games back in the day. Though, with CandyStand's revamping and the downfall of both Shockwave and Adobe Flash, the game in its original form is no longer available. However, a fellow named Ryan Silberman 
Lin went through the process of faithfully recreating the game from scratch before sharing it on itch.io. Given this remake was made in an unofficial manner, I am willing to count it for this video, even though the original technically wasn't. And let's be real, when else am I going to get the chance to talk about something like this? I actually remember playing the original back in the day. Can't remember if it was on CandyStand.com or if it got shared on another one of those Flash game sites, but regardless, I do oddly remember this game rather distinctly. The game takes you through nine holes of mini golf, with each hole having its own gimmick and a different Crash character PNG on the course. In fact, and I have no idea why this is still in my memory, but prior to playing for this video, I actually still remembered the character order. It went Coco, Crunch, Aku Aku, Cortex, Engine, Uka Uka, Tiny, Dingledale, and Entropy. And I distinctly remember that the Entropy hole contained water hazards, and the tiny hole had moving crabs as obstacles that were the worst. Okay, even that holds up. Not much to say about this one, admittedly. It's a pretty standard and a pretty decent mini golf game. The remade version actually adds a line to signify the power of your shot, which is certainly handy. Though on browser at least, it can be a bit finicky to get that first shot done, given how close to the edge of the screen you start, and your mouse clicks for hitting aren't detected when off the game screen. I do appreciate the use of music from the Crash GBA games as well. Those soundtracks are great. And hey, while I did kinda roughly at points in this, I actually got a hole in one on the last hole. Now, if only I were that good at actual mini golf. So, with that said and done, let's move on to the definitely more certain of label territory of unofficial Crash games. Starting with one of the more known Crash fan games, a hand drawn Flash game simply known as Crash Bandicoot. So, I actually couldn't find much about this game's development, not even a release year. Potentially it was 2006, going off the date shown on one of the sites it was hosted on, but I don't know if this is where it was first hosted. That said, much like Crash Nitro Mini Golf, I do remember playing this one back in the day, quite a few times actually. And, also much like Crash Nitro Mini Golf, it's no longer available online line due to the cancelled support of Adobe Flash. Fortunately, it was archived through the Blue Maxima Flashpoint project, this really cool program made to preserve games and animations made on Flash and other programs of that kind, including the previously mentioned Shockwave. And hey, a few different Crash Flash games were preserved, though if we went through all of them, we'd probably be here for a while, so I'll just stick with this one for the time being. This game played much like a traditional Crash game, taking heavy inspiration from Crash 2 in particular. Much of Crash's moveset is carried over from it, though I will say, it feels weird going back to a game like this with keyboard controls, let alone one that uses the arrow keys and spacebar. Yep, movement, jumping, and crouching are mapped to the arrow keys, and your spin attacks mapped to the spacebar. Welcome back to the 2000s, everyone! Okay, all joking aside, the game does control fine once you get used to the older control scheme, and it does help me appreciate that they kept it a simpler moveset, both for the sake of the controls and the level design. None of the levels get outlandishly hard, but they're not without their challenges, and ones that accommodate the control scheme relatively well. With the exception of the snow level. Remember what I said in my last video about not liking traditional ice physics? Yeah, stuff like this is what I meant. This was the only level I didn't end up getting the crate gem, all because of this hill right here. The ice physics on the hill were far too janky for me to reliably get that last crate in the air. Now the game's only 5 levels long, and given the warp room structure they've got going and the inclusion of stuff like unlockable power-ups from bosses, I presume they were intending on making more, but I guess it never came to fruition. That said, for only having 5 levels and one boss, they do tick off a fair few of the crash boxes no pun intended, even including a boulder chase level. Even the Ripper Roof fight was kinda neat, having you avoid the TNTs and nitros he throws on the platforms, and waiting for him to throw a metal box to spin back. It's simple, but hey, I die more to this fight than I tend to when fighting Ripper Roo in any other Crash game, so shoutouts to the devs for that. The levels are pretty short, with my full playthrough only lasting around 50 minutes or so as a result, but hey, the effort is certainly apparent, so I ain't gonna hold the length against them at all, especially for when it was made. I also won't hold the audio work against them, despite the lack of music after the title screen and the sheer ear-destroying volume of some of the sound effects. The game certainly got its rough parts, but for the time, this was pretty ambitious and pretty impressive. The game even had cheat codes to unlock more moves, which I do remember using back in the day. Probably stuff they intend on using for later on in the game before it got dropped. Though, as it turns out, that's not where our story ends. After I initially announced on Twitter that I was going to be doing this video, the tweet got noticed by both of the game's developers. And sure enough, they're still doing stuff, with one of them, Tyro Nuke, now developing mods for rhythm games. Gotta say, it makes me happy to see that they ended up doing more after the Crash Flash game, especially to this degree. Seriously, great job! 
Actually, speaking of that Twitter announcement, that brings us in nicely to our next game. After making my post on both YouTube and Twitter about this video, a few of the comments ended up bringing more unofficial Crash games to my attention that I had never heard of. One such game, as suggested by Roderick Goldberg, is the next game I'm going to be talking about, Crash Bandicoot Tiki Quest. This game was developed by Firestyle, who seems to have developed a few different fan games throughout the years, from Mario to Kirby to Mega Man X to, well, Crash Bandicoot. Well, I have no idea what to expect with this one, so let's just jump right in. The game begins with this silhouetted bandicoot-like figure causing a ruckus, which catches the attention of these villagers who suspiciously look like Animal Crossing characters. They go to Crash's house the next morning to confront him over last night's theft, with Coco and Aku Aku, the latter of which has weird-looking portrait art, defending him. After Crunch confirms Cortex's presence on the island, however, Coco suspects that Cortex has something to do with this imposter, and Crash jumps to action to prove his innocence. Now initially, I thought the silhouetted figure was going to be fake Crash or something, since, well, he's an already existing Crash doppelganger. But no, instead we get a brand new, edgy Crash doppelganger named Clyde Bandicoot. I genuinely started laughing when this reveal occurred. This trope is so, so cheesy, but I can't help but love it. Maybe it's because I grew up with stuff like Sonic Adventure 2, where Shadow was at his peak anti-Sonic phase, but I've definitely got a soft spot for this edgy doppelganger cliche, especially in contexts like this. And sure enough, yeah, he turns out to be Cortex's latest creation, so it's up to Crash to stop Cortex and Clyde from achieving their evil schemes. Well, until Clyde betrays Cortex, then it's about stopping Clyde from achieving his evil schemes. He even gets a cape once he's taken the main antagonist role, I love this so much. Now, gameplay-wise, TK Quest is a 2D platformer, but I wouldn't say it quite follows the Crash formula. Sure, it's got many elements of a traditional Crash game, but many of them are recontextualized into a more unique structure for the series. It's like you threw Crash, Kirby, and Donkey Kong Country into a blender. It's got stuff like crates and crystals and Wumpa Fruit, but it's also got Kirby's Adventure-esque hub worlds and room-by-room level structure, plus DKC-esque bonus levels to earn the crystals in. Heck, even the means of ending the level has that roulette wheel of prizes that many DKC games do. It's definitely a different feel for Crash, but hey, it does still fit him well. Crash himself does have a fair few of his classic abilities, but interestingly, he also has a few abilities from the Titans games, namely the Spin Jump and the Dig. The Dig I didn't tend to use often, but that Spin Jump proved to be incredibly useful at many points. He also has some additional abilities he unlocks over the course of the game, like a slide upgrade that turns it into an attack, and Wumpa Bombs. As one does. Now this game's keyboard only as well, but with abilities beyond basic movement being mapped to the Z, X, and C keys, rather than the spacebar. Still not my most ideal choice, but this does feel better than Crash Flash's control scheme. I don't know, I'm just more of a controller guy personally. And that preference did kind of show, because man was I tested by this game. It doesn't take long for this game to get quite difficult, and if you're used to using a controller like me, and thus occasionally blank on what key does what, the game will be sure to take advantage of your weaknesses. That said, barring a few occasions, I never felt this game got cheaply hard. These projectile shooting robots suck though, they're always placed in the most inconvenient spots. Fortunately, you do get a pretty funny treat whenever you die. <laughs> Yes, you heard that right. The Price is Right losing horn plays whenever you die. And it's hilarious. Actually, on that note, this game does utilize a few different sources for some of its assets. I already mentioned the Animal Crossing villagers, but we've also got backgrounds from Mario vs. Donkey Kong, enemies from Bubble Bobble, and MIDI remixes of music from Sonic Adventure, New Super Mario Bros. Wii, Diddy Kong Racing, Sonic CD, Bomberman 64, and even Donkey Kong Country 2. I dig this creator's taste in gaming music. But yeah, even though all these things come from very different sources, they do still fit together relatively well, even if it is a bit weird to see Crash characters interacting with Animal Crossing villagers, or attacking Bubble Bobble enemies. Okay, actually, speaking of enemies, that ties into something I really like about this game. So you know how in Crash games, when you spin an enemy, they just fly off screen? Well, in Tiki Quest, they get sent flying into the nearest solid object before exploding. The visual and audio feedback behind defeating enemies is generally one of the most entertaining aspects of this game, especially when spinning an enemy into an explosive. Seriously, look at this. Like, it's so oddly intense, but I kind of love it for that. It's especially great in levels like this one where you drive a car through the city and you just... And continuing on with enemies, the bosses are really solid too. A bit tricky to figure out on your first few attempts, but once you know what you're doing, they're quite fun challenges. My only issue with them though, whenever you die to them, you get sent back to the hub world, requiring you to re-enter the portal and re-watch the pre-boss cutscene. It may not seem that bad, but after multiple failed attempts on a single boss, it can get annoying. But yeah, the thing I said about the Crash Flash Ripperoo fight being harder than the official fights, 
same applies here. Though on top of all that, there are more gameplay features. For instance, there's coins, which you get both through picking them up, and through your level end tally with the number of enemies you beat and number of crates you broke, both being converted into an equal number of coins. You can take these coins to Pura's shop, of all Crash characters to be a shopkeeper, I can't say I was expecting Pura, to buy extra lives or an instant revive, or keys to secret levels. There's also Crunch and his special challenges, where you go through levels in other contexts, such as playing through a level with only 1 HP. Oh yeah, this game also adds a full-on health system. There was certainly a lot more meat on this game's bones than I initially thought there'd be, that's for sure. So yeah, if you couldn't tell, I really liked this one. Seriously, Tiki Quest is great. It keeps that Crash charm and feel, all while trying its own things with the gameplay. And sure, I wasn't the best at it, but I did have a solid time playing it. Now granted, I didn't end up finishing it, as you're required to get all the crystals to access the final part of the game, which, given I only managed to get three crystals by that point, I was good to stop there. But yeah, I definitely recommend giving this one a go if you're looking for something like this to play. Though I do suggest finding a means to increase the screen size. The game window can't be normally increased in size, and the default size is really small. For instance, this was my setup when playing, having the game window active and in the corner, while using the OBS preview as my visual. Made it a lot easier to play in this case. With that said though, how about we hop to another one of those I never heard of this game until someone brought it up instances. This time, as suggested on Twitter by Megan Manetrix 2000 we're going to take a look at Crash Bandicoot Apocalypse. I mean, with a title like that, how could I resist? This game was developed by a Crash fan known as Hyper Golem, who seems to have done a few different Crash fan games actually, with Crash Bandicoot Apocalypse having come out in 2018. Going off the trailer at least, it seems to be closer to a traditional Crash game than Tiki Quest was, and it seems to take some influence from Wrath of Cortex of all games. What with the elementals being involved? Well, let's give this game a go and see for ourselves, shall we? The game begins with Cortex and Uka Uka at this elemental shrine of sorts, with an artifact in hand that'll free the elementals or at least a bootleg replica, according to Cortex. Sure enough though, the bootleg works, and the elementals are not only freed, but get their full bodies restored. Who knew bootlegs could be so powerful? With the return strength, the elementals begin causing natural disasters worldwide, and with Aku Aku determining that it's the elementals' handiwork, Crash makes his way to go stop the elemental apocalypse. So story-wise, it's basically Wrath of Cortex, but without Crunch as a host for the elementals. But you know what? I'm not opposed to that. Giving the elementals a chance to stand out on their own is something I welcome. Now as for the gameplay, as I presumed, Apocalypse plays much like a traditional Crash game. Break all the crates to get a gem, bonus rounds have the classic structure, warp room level select, you name it. Though crystals are now collectibles you get in death rooms. No titans moves or wampa bombs this time around either. Crash plays much more like how he does in those classic games. Though interestingly, his slide jump functions a bit more like how it did in Twin Sanity, prioritizing distance over height. Crash actually controls really well overall, with the slide especially feeling really good to pull off. And while yes, we're using keyboard controls again, at this point I've gotten used to it, so I definitely didn't have as many brain fart deaths with the controls as I did with Tiki Quest. Nah, most of my deaths in Apocalypse were because of a different issue, but we'll get there shortly. Each warp room takes you through four levels before you fight that world's elemental. Oddly though, despite using the warp room structure, you're still locked to going through the levels in order. Granted, I always go in numerical order, but yeah. And while its story is inspired by Wrath of Cortexes, the levels go for a variety of environments from various Crash games rather than sticking strictly to what Wrath of Cortex brought to the table. Heck, they're straight up bridge levels a la Crash 1, and yep, they get just as hard. Actually, as a whole, this game is far from easy, with tricky jumps and enemy placement to constantly keep you on your toes. And I would call it a fair difficulty if it weren't for that one issue I alluded to earlier. Maybe I was just horribly unlucky, but this game seems to have an issue with hitboxes and collision. Oftentimes, the game would say I didn't make the jump because I was just a single pixel off, and there were too many times to count where an enemy would do damage or kill me, even when they otherwise shouldn't. These plant enemies especially. Look, I successfully spun it away and I still died. This was especially annoying during the boss fight against Wawa, the water elemental, whose weird bubble attack would register as hitting me even though, at the point of contact, it had already disappeared. Actually, on a note of weird issues, even though the controls are overall really good, there is one control problem I tended to have, which is one that sometimes happens in the official games as well. That being the game pre-registering your first jump when you go to jump off an edge. So your first jump input is recognized as your double jump, and thus you plummet down to your death for something that wasn't necessarily your fault. This happened... a lot in Apocalypse. And this combined with the hitbox and collision issues did make this game a bit more annoyingly hard for me. Though while we're on negatives, there's also the matter of the mini-bosses. I will admit, 
I like the idea of a crash villain showing up at the end of a level for a mini boss fight of sorts, but I can't say I was the biggest fan of the execution. Tiny's fight especially. You have to lure him into landing by a TNT as it explodes, but lining up the timing of his jumps with the TNT going off felt like pure luck more often than not. That said, the elemental boss fights were pretty cool, Wawa bubble problem aside. Pyro's especially was fun. Another thing of note with this game is the art style. The game's visuals and sprites go for a more hand-drawn style, and I do think they work well for this game. Animations can be a bit simplistic, sure, but this is a fan game with what I imagine is a small team. I'm not expecting the most intricate animations out there. The soundtrack's also pretty good, consisting largely of remixes of other Crash songs, and maybe songs from other games, but I couldn't pick up on any specific ones like I did with Tiki Quest. The remixes were done by B13CW, who's done a fair amount of Crash remixes in the past, such as much of the CTR and Nitro Kart soundtracks while we were waiting for Nitro Fuel to come out. It's good stuff! But yeah, Crash Bandicoot Apocalypse is pretty good. A bit rough in areas, but overall a solid classic style Crash game. Hypergolem has since released another Crash game, Crash Bandicoot Psyched Out. And going off the trailer, it seems to be very inspired by Crash Twin Sanity, with Crash and Cortex both being playable and working together. Even the snowboarding was included. Though I think I'll save that game for another time, maybe another one of these videos if I ever choose to do a second one. Regardless, Hypergolem's hard work is definitely on full display with these projects, wishing you and your team the best with whatever you've got next. Now so far, we've just been looking at the 2D side of the world of unofficial Crash games, which there are still plenty more of. But now that we've gotten a taste of what the fans have had to offer with 2D, what say we add a Z-axis in the mix and check out some 3D Crash fan games? Probably the most well-known 3D Crash fan game out there is Crash Bandicoot Crystal's Wrath, a game currently in development by Pat Strikes Back and Jump Button CB, with development dating back to 2013, if not earlier. Unfortunately, there's no public release for it currently, so I wasn't able to try it out for this video. But hey, I felt it'd be cool to talk about it anyway. Instead of following the formula of any of the official Crash games, Crystal's Wrath is going for a more open-world approach, allowing you to tackle various areas and challenges in basically any order, with the overall goal of the game being to collect a certain amount of mojo, and the game's set to give you a variety of ways to do so. You could explore levels and platform around for some, you could go to an arcade or a casino to try and gamble mojo, heck, you can even go the pirate route and partake in naval combat against other pirates. Move over, Sea of Thieves! The Seven Seas belong to good old Cash Banuka. No, 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 no! No! It's definitely an ambitious looking project, and I have no idea how soon we can expect to see a release, but it's certainly looking to be a unique experience for the franchise. Best of luck with this, Pat and JB. Another relatively well-known one is Crash Bandicoot Time Twister, a fan remake of Crash Bandicoot Warped or at least was going to be a fan remake of Crash Bandicoot Warped. It first began development in 2015, but was cancelled in early 2017. I imagine most of you will be able to guess why. Before cancelling the project though, one of its levels was completed and released to the public. Coincidentally, it just so happens to be one of Warped's best levels, Tomb Waiter. I did try to get this one working, but unfortunately I had some strange issues regarding missing files when I downloaded it, so I wasn't able to play it myself. And all after waiting over 5 hours for the latest version of Unreal Engine 4 to install. So I'll just have to talk about it going off the footage from the developers. And I will say, for a work in progress from a small team of fans, this looks pretty solid. A bit much on the bloom and the lighting at some points, but having worked with Unreal Engine before, I can confirm that that tends to happen. But yeah, the level is quite faithfully done, and it does look like it controls pretty alright. There's definitely potential present here. Or, well, was. But you know what I mean. It is a shame that the project ended up cancelled, though given the circumstance, I can understand why. I'm not sure if the dev team have moved on to a new project since this, but if they have, I do hope it's going well for them. And hopefully it won't need to be cancelled because of something else coming out. Okay, so admittedly, I did struggle a bit with finding 3D Crash fan games to play for this video. There are a handful out there, but I couldn't easily find a means to try them out for myself or in the case of Time Twister, couldn't get them to work. Some just straight up aren't available anymore, like this one, Crash Bandicoot in Retro World. Though looking at this gameplay, I'm not sure if I'd be the same man after playing it. But I did manage to find some material, thanks to one Ali Al-Hakim. I apologize if I pronounced that wrong. Here we have Crash Bandicoot Adventure, released in 2016. Going in completely blind with this one, so let's just jump right in. Maybe I shouldn't have jumped that in. Also, Sonic's here for some reason. And now he's dead. So gameplay-wise, this does play like a traditional Crash game, just... Yeah... Like, I don't want to be mean to this fan creator, especially since this seems to be their first game, but... 
It's a bit rough, let's just put it that way. The movement feels really, really stiff, not helped by how slow Crash's running animation is compared to how quick the run actually is. While your jump has you skyrocketing upwards, well, half the time it does. The other half of times, you barely move an inch. It does make platforming simultaneously a cakewalk and a nightmare, as the high jump allows you to bypass most obstacles, but the few times your jump won't get you far enough and you need to do precision platforming, well, depth perception will be your enemy here. And this is assuming you don't just fall to your death immediately because the jump chose not to work that time. Also, at the end of Crash's spin, he does what looks like a half-hearted dab. Actually, I have a quick question. Given this janky jumping, what's the one level type across the classic games that would probably be the most torturous to get through? If you said the bridge levels, congratulations! Now please send help. I actually didn't even bother finishing this level or the toxic hallway level afterwards. The only sometimes functioning jump screwed me over more times than I had the patience for. Fortunately, the final level is successful right from the get-go, so I went ahead and went through it. It's a simple hallway level in Cortex's space station, and this initially made me think there was going to be a boss fight at the end. Instead, though... You know, after making that dab joke, I feel like I kind of deserve this. Also, I am being 100% honest when I say this. The song that plays in this section is Bangarang by Skrillex. Not a MIDI remix or anything, the actual song. Only reason I'm not showing is because I know for a fact there'd be a copyright claim on this video for doing so. But trust me, I couldn't make this up if I tried. Also, Crash now has MLG shades. Speaks for itself, really. Also, also, once you reach Cortex at the end, the game blue screens. And then takes you to the ending screen. Part of me feels like we're not going to end up peeking this. And on top of all that, there's this Crash Lost World portal in the warp room. And it takes us to... Sonic Lost World. Not entirely sure why, but you're able to play through Windy Hill Act 1 as Crash. Though speaking of Sonic, Big the Cat's present at several points of the game, including inside a crate behind this fake wall. Which also has a screenshot from the amazing world of Gumball. 2016 was a very different time. So yeah, that was... Definitely an adventure, all right. Wouldn't say it was necessarily a good one, but hey, the title didn't lie. Now, Ali does have a newer Crash fan game in the works, known as Crash Bandicoot World, and I will say, going off the videos they've posted, it does look a fair bit better and more polished than Adventure was. So at least they've seemed to have proved their craft since 2016. Though all I'm wondering now is if this game's gonna have an MLG room as well. Now, as I said earlier, I wasn't able to access many of the 3D Crash fan games out there, but I also don't want to leave it to just this small batch. Fortunately, I have a solution. So for the next handful of games, we're going to play Dreams. Not sure how many of you know or remember this game, but Dreams was a PlayStation exclusive release at the start of last year. It was developed by Media Molecule, the creators of Little Big Planet, and was basically made to be Little Big Planet on a much grander scale. Instead of just making platformer levels or whatever other crazy stuff people were able to do on it, Dreams allows you to make... Well, just about anything. Of course, this has led to a lot of meme stuff being made, as to be expected, but there's also been a lot of genuine projects made on this software, and it's really impressive to see what's truly possible with these tools, whether it be artsy puzzle platformers, simulation racing games, or bowling with guns. <laughs> Yes, this is real. And, as to be expected, many have used Dreams to make their own Crash stuff, whether it be games or even just recreations of environments from the series. Now, there's a lot, and I mean a lot, of Crash fan games on Dreams, so I won't be able to cover every single one of them. Instead, I'll be taking a look at a few personal highlights across this collection, to give you a taste of the kind of stuff people are making on here. For example, we have a fan-made Crash Bandicoot 4. So between this, Wrath of Cortex, and It's About Time, that's three Crash 4s. One off from having four Crash 4s, that'd just be perfect. Though according to the in-game title screen, it's actually called Crash Bandicoot Adventures. Not to be confused with Crash Bandicoot Adventure, two very different games. Oh hey, we've got ourselves the Crash Bash Warp Room. Cool, I've always liked the look of this one. Well, first impressions, it definitely looks and plays better than Crash Bandicoot Adventure. I also quite like the very PS1-inspired look for Crash here. It's oddly cute. And while yes, your double jump still takes you flying upwards, it's definitely far more controllable here than in Adventure. I also really like this first environment, especially with the way the lava looks. Dreams tends to have this unique visual style for certain effects, and this here's a good example. Shame the level is... very... short. That's been pretty common across a few of these Crash fan games, but this one especially really felt short. And that's definitely felt with the next level as well, Nightly Stroll which takes place in the sky during the daytime. You use platform across these clouds, collecting red crystals along the way, and then the level ends in less than a minute. Hmm. I don't know, maybe the next level will be longer. Let's see, Cloud Jumper. Wait, hold on. And this portal takes me into... another warp room? Odd. Oh, here we go. 
Wait, this looks like a level that should be called Nightly Stroll. I'm confused now. Oh well, now we got some Crash GBA music. I ain't complaining. And the level's already over. I'm starting to think all the levels are gonna be like this. Wait, what? Wait, 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 what? Wait, where did I teleport to? Okay, I guess I'll just go through this green portal. And now I'm in what feels like a completely different game with completely different collectibles. I don't get what's going on anymore. I think this is a sign that it's time to move on. This next one's a work in progress for a fan remake of the original Crash Bandicoot game. Well, this ought to be interesting. Oh, starting with a recreation of the PS1 startup. I very much approve of this so far. Oh, I will say I do like the inclusion of the CRT TV effect. That said, not a big fan of how Crash looks here, particularly the mouth. I don't know, it's a work in progress, so maybe that'll be updated over time. So it's a pretty simple recreation of N Sandy Beach, but hey, it does control pretty decently. With the exception of one aspect. For some reason, you're locked in place when you spin on the ground, which makes attacking or even just breaking crates way harder than it needs to be. Also, I don't know if this was a glitch or by design, but Aku Aku's particle effect kept replaying after getting his second mask, and it was very distracting. And then I got stuck at the bottom of a pit. I guess this is where my run of this ends. Does show promise though, so I do hope the creator of this keeps it up. Okay, actually, I think I want to try something a bit different. We've been playing a lot of Crash platformer fan games so far, so what do you say we try a Crash Racing fan game? There's actually a few different Crash Racing games on Dreams, though most of them are just test rooms. Fortunately though, there is one that's a bit more than that, Crash Dreams Racing. So to start, we choose our character, and hey, we've got a few different options. Crash, Coco, Cortex, Oxide, Dingo Dial, Amy Bandicoot who's apparently too detailed to have on the character select screen, Ripperoo, Koala Kong, and... original the character. And we've also got six tracks. Bandicoot Beach, Taz Corp Circuit, Pizza... Planet? Chemical... Plant... W wait... Racing on the Rainbow... Rainbow Road SNES? Well, this is gonna be interesting. Let's start with Bandicoot Beach. Curious if it's at all like the track of the same name from Crash Bandicoot Nitro Kart 2 on iOS. Yep, that was a thing that existed at one point. Oh, hey, it actually uses Bandicoot Beach's music. Cool. All right, let's get this race started. So first impressions, it actually controls pretty all right. Note to self, don't use speed panels. As I was saying, first impressions, it actually controls pretty all right. Turning's a teeny bit stiff, but nothing unmanageable. And there is a drift system. No power slide boosting, though. So you've got something to fall back on. That said, even though it controls decently, the rest of the game is kind of janky. You can freely move the camera around while racing, but there's certain points, especially when going uphill, where the camera will just lock into place at the most awkward angle for seeing where you're going. And that's before mentioning the way the physics act up at points. Smash. Though if we're talking janky physics, nowhere is that more apparent than with the character models. What do I mean by that? Well... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how this happened, but the character models in this game aren't the most stable. Very often, the character's limbs or head will just kind of... fall off. Seriously, I thought we were playing Crash Dreams Racing, not Monty Python Kart. Just a flesh wound. Interestingly, the same person behind this also started a second CTR fan game on Dreams, this time called Crash Team Racing Dreams Project Racing. Granted, it's only a test room for an adventure mode right now, but hey, they seem to be incorporating CTR's power slide boost system now, so that's really cool. Question is, are the models more stable this time? Ah, uh, nope, Crash's head came off. You know what? Why not? Let's see how much more we can break him. Did Crash's cart just yeet itself out of existence? Though on that note, I do want to put focus on easily the best Crash game currently on Dreams. A little something known as Crash Bandicoot Trip Sanity. I know, not the best title, but trust me, this one's a goodie. Serving as a kind of sequel to Twin Sanity, Trip Sanity starts within Crash's head, where he dreams of Tana being captured by Cortex, and him saving her. Though not before giving his duplicate the Mufasa treatment. <laughs> So first thing of note, this game controls wonderfully. A lot of the other 3D Crash Fan games, both ones I did and didn't talk about, tended to have control issues, where they'd be too stiff or too floaty or somehow both. But Trip Sanity, Crash controls perfectly. At no point did I have an issue regarding the controls. But yeah, you scale your way up this tower to get to Cortex, where you have a throwdown with him to save Tana. Now be careful not to let him spin back the green plasma blast. Threefold hits and we're done for. <laughs> if only he knew. 
Okay, they incorporated some of Lex Lang's Cortex dialogue. Neato. Once you beat Cortex, though, Crash, Coco, and Crunch are sucked away in this wormhole of sorts, and brought before Cortex's supposed good counterpart from the 10th dimension, who I am choosing to refer to as Ned Cortex to prevent confusion. So Ned Cortex tells Crash that Crash, Coco, and Crunch's evil counterparts from the 10th dimension are up to no good, and Ned will require crystals for his newest device that'll supposedly stop them. Can you bring me some crystals to fuel my latest creation and... Help as many people as possible. Right. So for the gameplay, Trip Sandy actually goes through with being that free-roaming sandbox platformer that Traveler's Tales wanted both Wrath of Cortex and Twin Sanity to be, with multiple crystals hidden in each level that you can obtain in any order. There are a few exceptions, but most of the levels follow this structure. And hey, now we have proof that Crash would work well in this format. Because hey, Crash works well in this format in this case. And the environments are all nice and varied and look pretty solid, with those dreams visual effects working to the game's benefit at multiple points. One of these levels even has a boss fight against Dingo Dial, where he takes some of his attacks from his twin sanity fight and goes even more aggressively nuts with them than before. It's a fun challenge. Though if we're talking boss fights, once you beat the six levels currently available, you get access to Evil Crunch's hideout, with Evil Crunch himself fighting you at the end. And genuinely, this fight is great. Constantly on your toes as he barrages you with crystal missiles and tornadoes and shockwaves while you wait for his shields to go down. It's a solid challenge and a really fun fight. Now that's as far as the game goes as of now, but it's sounding like the creator intends on having you go up against Evil Crash and Evil Coco as well, so I'm definitely going to keep an eye on this game. If you couldn't tell yet, there is a vast amount of creative talent within the Crash Bandicoot community, and it's been great to see what they're capable of doing with these characters and concepts in their own hands. Whether it be sticking to the series' roots, or trying something completely different, each game's got its own special touch to bring to the table. Even the bizarre stuff like Crash Bandicoot Adventure, you certainly wouldn't see this anywhere else in the series. Above all else, it just goes to show how impactful Crash's legacy has been over the past 25 years, to inspire this many people, and more, to get those creative juices flowing and make games you otherwise wouldn't see from the official development teams. So with that, I wish you a happy 25th anniversary, Crash Bandicoot. Wait, 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 wait. Ben? Ben. ben. Hold on a moment, aren't you forgetting something? something? Wait, what? Who was that? You didn't say at the start of the video you were going to have more than just fan games. games. Oh. Right. I think, I think you, you know, know what, what that means. means. Bootleg time. Heck yeah, it's bootleg time! Nice to see you too, Alex. How long have you even been here? Dude, I've been here since the video started. Like, the moment I heard you were gonna be talking about bootlegs, I knew I had to jump on this. Especially given one of the games you're gonna be talking about. Uh... So while a majority of the unofficial Crash games out there are fan games, there are indeed a handful of bootleg Crash games floating around in our world. I'm personally only aware of two of them myself, both of which we'll be looking at now. The first of these is one that Alex here introduced me to in the flesh, funny enough. Yeah, Ben and I actually met up in person at Momocon in Atlanta back in 2017, along with a bunch of other people from the old Countdown community we were in. While I was there, I had Ben and a few other folks try out this bootleg game system I bought from a flea market earlier that year. The PvP Station Light 2000. Feel free to guess what it was a bootleg version of. Even just going off the box, you can already tell this system is kind of an anomaly. Like, it markets its 8-bit games while also having 3D capabilities. Like what, are you talking about like 3DS, 3D, or like 3D polygonal graphics, that kind of thing. But the real selling point on this box is the beautiful FULL COLOR LCD SCREEN! MORE! BRIGHTER! And of course, the box made sure to let you know Crash was present. Front and center, on the box, back of the box, both sides of the box, it was kinda hard to miss. As for the system itself... Oh boy. First off, despite being a carbon copy of the PSP, you actually need to have it plugged in to work, but that quickly becomes the least of the system's problems when actually using it. For instance, despite looking like it has four directional buttons and four face buttons, it actually has two of them. That's right, some of the face buttons were actually directly connected together. You press X, that circle button's moving as well. Coupled with the fact that the screen on this thing is actually slightly tilted and not level, you've got yourself a beautiful little talking point. PSP. No, son. We already have a PSP at home. PSP at home. Now, the system only comes with one cartridge, and it's one of those thousands of games in one kind of cartridges. 999,777 in one, to be specific. And I imagine most of them are just copy-pastes of one another. But it's when you boot up the system without the cartridge, for some reason, that the real magic occurs. Because this is how you access the system's exclusive crash game. 
the one, the only, Walt Disney's Crash. It's so beautiful. So yeah, the Crash game that the system's box constantly hypes up is just a bootleg version of the Jungle Book on NES, just replacing Mowgli with definitely not Crash. Ben, the, the title says it all. It's Walt Disney's Crash. All right, let's just get this over with. Crash begins his journey through the jungle to find the Man Village. Yeah, so that's what Cortex is calling his newest hideout, huh? Those meddling marsupials will never be able to defeat me! Ha 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 ha! The game speaks for itself, really. Like, if you're familiar with The Jungle Book on NES or its other notorious bootleg version, The Lion King, which Varg Skeletor Joel covered in one of his bootleg streams, then it's basically just that. Only this time with the stiffest of controls thanks to the system you're playing it on. Yep, it's all coming back to me now. Those controls were unbelievably hard to work with, and just the whole thing felt like it wasn't real. But it was, and I was playing it. You left me horribly broken after that, Alex. Broken is right, the screams you uttered that day will echo in my brain for the rest of my life. Okay, yeah, I think I've had my fill with this for the rest of my life. Thanks for stopping by, though, Alex. Hey, not a problem, Ben. For this topic, I was just happy to provide the, you know, bare necessities. Okay, time for you to go. Already on it. Take care! Darn it, now I've got that song stuck in my head. And for this next bootleg, which is also our final game of the video, I am obligated to read an ancient text relating to it. <clears throat> my friend had a GBA game called Crash Advance 4, and the controls were A to spin, B to jump. It had long and extremely difficult levels in it. He told me his aunt in Saudi Arabia sent him it. But now he has lost and tells me he bought it in-game and the box had Crash holding a wumpa fruit in the cover. Has anyone else heard of this game? These words were first written and shared in 2006 by a wise man known only by the title Dingo Dial 555. For much time, these words were nothing more than mere legend, as such a game wasn't believed to have existed. Until, nearly a decade later, a veteran fan of the Bandicoot, one Smaz by name, unearthed the relics spoken of via an eBay auction. And thus, such words were proven to be true. Such a game did exist. And then the ROM files for it got dumped online by Ribshark in 2020. Well, that's just the basics of this game's history. Seriously, I'd recommend reading up on it on Crash Mania. The story behind this game's discovery and uncovering is kinda wild. But yeah, here we have Crash Advance 4, a Game Boy Advance bootleg developed by Syntax, a Taiwan-based game studio with several dozen bootlegs under their belt on both Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance. Crash Advance 4 is one of their generally more known games nowadays, thanks to the efforts of Dingo Dial 555, Smaz, and Ribshark. So I felt it could make for an interesting way to wrap up this video. Now, I wasn't fortunate enough to get a copy of the cartridge myself, but I doubt anyone will mind if I make an exception to my usual owning a game before I emulate it mindset this time around. So first off, the title has me confused. Why Crash Advance 4? Sure, Entranced was numbered with a 2, but where's the third GBA game then? Was Syntax counting Crash Purple as Crash Advance 3? And why am I even bothering to overthink this? Especially since they can't seem to stay consistent with their own title. As according to the title screen, it's not Crash Advance 4, but instead Crash Crash Bandicoot 4, which means, between this, Wrath of Cortex, It's About Time, and the Dreams Crash 4 that was also known as Crash Bandicoot Adventures, we do indeed have four Crash 4s. Anyway, let's not waste any more time and get started. Okay, we're going to Dreamlike Water City, apparently. Interesting level name. That ain't no Water City. So yeah, this is... Certainly a bootleg Crash game on GBA. Limited frames on Crash's idle animation, that wonderful background music, pure quality. So what we've got here is a 2D platformer, with an emphasis on the word platform. Like, this is some seriously simplistic level design. Just throw floating platforms all over the place. I shouldn't be surprised, but these controls are some of the stiffest I've ever experienced in a platformer, with a jump that has you going up like you're on the moon, but dropping like a boulder on the way down. Also, for some reason, if you hold up before you jump, your jump is notably higher. Odd choice. Also, also, Dingo Dial 555 wasn't entirely accurate with their original statement. Yes, B is jump, which is very awkward as is, but A actually doesn't do the spin. Instead, it has Crash throw blue fireballs? Interesting new power you've got there, Crash. Though, since any and all momentum freezes when doing the attack, even when in midair, spamming it does allow you to glide, for lack of a better term, and make some of the challenges way easier than they'd otherwise be. And trust me, you're gonna need that, because this game, to no surprise, is beyond janky. A 
especially with the enemies. Broken movement patterns, disappearing from existence out of nowhere, or heck, even altering the game's music. Some enemies' deaths will result in a new music track jumping in, which will reset every time these enemies die. And some enemies' presence just kills the music entirely. Though hey, at least you know when one of these enemies are present when the music abruptly stops and turns into buzzing. Speaking of which, how about that soundtrack, eh? Truly up there in quality with the other Crash GBA games? Class of gaming music, that's for certain. It took me a while, 10 minutes to be specific, but I got through the dreamlike Not Water City. Which brings us to level 2, Stray in Woods. Some truly inspiring level names we've got here. Not much changes at this point, aside from the most fascinating doorway I think I've ever seen. But then, just as I reach the end, I enter a boss arena? Yeah, this game has bosses as it turns out. First one we've got is Tiny Tiger, whose main ability is flickering while teleporting around the arena. And then he randomly died, I guess. Anyway, moving on to level 3, Miss Trey Desert City. Just watch though, it's gonna end up being a water city. Oh my goodness, I was joking! This level actually proved to be pretty annoying, or rather, more annoying than the others. There's a lot more verticality to this one, so any falls, which given this game can happen quite easily, can and often will result in a lot of lost progress. I trudged through though, it took me over 10 minutes this time, but I did it. And that got me to level 4, Roundabout Path. And if by round, they meant the collision axis if you're walking on rounded ground even when you're not, then I do get the point of naming here. This level also has a boss fight at the end, this time against Dingo Dial. His means of attacking is by running around at the speed of sound, while also flickering. I kinda just kept throwing fireballs until he died off screen, and... Yeah, that was the game. Can't say this is quite what I was expecting for Dingo Dial's first outing as a final boss, but take what you can get, I guess. The end, says Aku Aku. Well, that's 39 minutes I'm never gonna get back. Though hey, as one person put it, I survived the pain. Actually, wait, that's Smaz. How do these people that are relevant to the games I'm playing for this video keep finding my tweets? And that marks everything I had lined up for this... wild ride of a video. Hope you all enjoyed it. And since I did my whole legacy speech earlier, I'm just gonna keep it simple and say, I wish you a happy 25th anniversary, Crash Bandicoot. Though before we wrap up, there's a few things I'd like to do. First off, shoutouts to Alex Roshan for lending a hand in cameoing during the Walt Disney's Crash segment. Alex really does like his bootlegs, and given he's the one who first introduced me to that system and game, and provided the footage showing off the system itself, I felt it'd be fitting, and fun, for him to make an appearance. And speaking of cameos, I'd also like to thank Lex Lang, yes, the official voice of Cortex, for his brief appearance during the same segment, and to the website Cameo for allowing such an opportunity to be possible. And finally, a few of you had noted in the last video that you missed the personal recommendations part. Admittedly, it had slipped my mind when making that video, but rest assured, we're gonna make up for that this time. For today's personal recommendation, I've got another person in the countdown review side of things, one Count Shaman. Now some of you may know of this fellow, whether that be from him being an editor for Josh Scorcher, or for the worst Mega Man Zero Bosses video he did with the quarter guy a year ago. But if not, he mostly focuses on countdowns and reviews, as I noted a moment ago. And they're quite good, all with the unique flair of having a well-dressed Spider-Man. Wait, to give you all a taste of his work from his own channel... Even the villain sucks. Regal went from a mysterious schemer with a thought-provoking philosophy to a brain-dead idiot who just laughs and spots I'M EVIL, FEAR ME! It helps that the IROC stands out as a more complete boss compared to the game's simpler adversaries. Well, handstand, but it counts. Normally it won't be so bad, but there are bridges that require you to lob your bombs at really precise spots to make it work. Making continuous streaks of these absurdly precise bridges will get under your skin really fast. I mean look at this, this is the first level of the game, and its hidden areas make you do this. Why can't you just put collectibles behind hidden walls like a normal game wall? But yeah, I do recommend checking out his work, it's good stuff. With that all said and done though, this has been Black Mage Benjamin, and until the next video, have a nice day everybody.